Amen. Before you see seated, turn to the left and right and welcome everybody in the house of the Lord tonight. Outreaches every day, but it takes finances, and we get to be part of that. I see a lot of people raising their hands if we got envelopes. All right, amen. Amen. Let's take care of them. And all right, we're gonna. I'm gonna pray. Father, just the love that you have is surpassing all comprehension, Lord. And so we just thank you for it. We thank you that uh, not only do you touch us here, but you touch people around the world. And Father, this is. This place is yours, Lord. So we thank you that we have a place called Church on the Street. We thank you that we have an opportunity to give back. I pray that you bless your people as to give and continue to use us for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 comes up, we're going to, um, I guess you got a special skit, if you will, or, <laughs> amen, just come on up. And we're gonna do it. Oh, nice to see you. 
Didn't know that's kind of like our theme song around here. 
Thanks for change. There's an army rising up. Amen. Yeah. Right. Well, we get, I'm going to have uh, Sam from Korea come up and introduce his pastor and tell us a little bit about why they're here and what they're doing and, and uh, ask him, well, what church are you guys from? And he says, we're all from Korea. You know, I said, the whole country is like, I guess they're on a mission trip and I didn't know that there was like uh, a bunch of them. Right, and so, anyway, Sam's going to come on up. This is Sam, and he's going to introduce his pastor. Right? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Hallelujah. God is good. And then, he's good all the time. Wow, the sisters. Body worship was so powerful yeah. because Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. There's a power in the name of Jesus, yeah. and when you trust in the name of Jesus, God will help you to break out all the chains in your life. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So we gotta depend on the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. You got a power because He's the Son of God and the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we came from Korea, about 40 church, small churches, they got united to come to America. So there's about 40 different churches. Uh, we are so blessed to visit the Dream Center. You have a dream because the name of Jesus. You have a hope because the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'd like to introduce the director pastor. Pastor Saul, would you come here? You know how old is he? He's uh, 60. <laughs> 64. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, 62. Uh, 63, he said. But I, I've been since, even I've been knowing about 22 years ago, but his heart is less than younger than 30 years. He got passion for the Christ. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Thank you for your kindness and receiving us. Okay. Uh, 1885년에 미국 선교사님들이 한국에 많이 오셔서 죽으셨어요. 복음을 전하기 위해서 오셔서 죽으셨습니다. Uh, during the back time, about 1885 years old, and 1885 years, many missionaries came to the Korea from America, mm. and they got, they got died, they got, they got persecuted in Korea. Yes, 현재는 5천만 명인데 우리 한국 인구가 남한이 천만 명이 크리스천이 되었다는 말이에요. 그래서 그래서 때. Yeah, right now in South Korea, about 50 million we have population. And about one fifth is a Christian, so 10 million, at least 10 million is a Christian. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Well, uh, 6 전쟁, 한국 전, Korean War, uh, 27년 전이죠. Uh, 77년 전. Yeah. We had the Korean War, uh, 1953. 1953. 35,000명의 미국 군인들이 와서 우리를 이기게 보호하러 죽었어요. About that time, 35,000 U.S. soldiers they got far from our country. They got killed. They got yeah, they died. 그리고 많은 고아 아들을 돌봐주고 또 먹을 것을 우리에게 줬습니다. And at that time, many U.S. Army they fed the orphans. Orphanages, and they take, they took care of them. 
and I grew up, I ate the bread, it came from the America made by the, some cornbread. <laughs> Thank you. So we came for the mission trip because we've been having many grace death from you. So we're gonna give it to you back a little bit. So, or Venice Beach, California Venice Beach. So, so we are evangelizing. Yeah, before we come to here at the Venice Beach LA area, we uh, we did our only three days at the Venice Beaches. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So we came to finish because we are gonna bless this city. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your love. Thank you so much. Thank you. Say from the heart of Church on the Street, welcome. Yep. God bless, and uh, it's exciting to see what Jesus is doing around the world. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, without further ado, I'm going to have Pastor Eugene come up and share from his heart. From the word of God. Hey. First of all, I tell you, thank you guys for coming. Um, beautiful presence. You know, Pastor, you have already blessed Phoenix, even tonight. As I'm worshiping with you guys, um, beautiful spirit. I just feel, you know, I've been all over the world, but I know one thing is true, and that is that you may have a different language, you may have different culture, but... The Holy Spirit and the love of God goes across every barrier. And I'm honored, I'm honored to be with you tonight. So thank you for being here. It's awesome. Praise God and blessings. Blessings on your trip. How long are you here? We're going to stay about two weeks. Two weeks. Tremendous. On Tuesday morning? Good. Tomorrow, just, you know, turn, turn us upside down with revival tomorrow. How's that? <laughs> you have one day to do that, all right? But praise God. Thank you for being here. And you know, breaking chains gets messy, doesn't it? <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for that beautiful skit that you did. Praise the Lord. God is great, isn't he? It's always a joy to be here. It really is. So thankful to have this church family. Uh, you guys are a blessing to me. I tell you, I just love coming. I really do. And it is always a joy to be here. Anybody know what this is? What? Well, I don't really know the official name of it, but... Okay, but it sounds good, all right? You know, I got this in Africa. It's a lion club. A lion club. So we went to the. So you guys better be careful over here, right? Don't sneak it up on me. <laughs> that would hurt. But I'm like, I got this in Africa, and the Maasai tribe use it because they kill lions. But I mean, I'm looking at this thing like I don't want to get that close <laughs> to a lion, right? That's pretty. That's pretty frightening, isn't it? I wouldn't get, but they do, they use these to chase them down, they hit them in the head, and they kill the lions, and of course they do all kinds of stuff with the lion, like drink their blood and stuff like that, but you don't want to, don't want to go there tonight, but <laughs> many years ago, 
when my kids were teenagers. A friend of mine talked us into going to Africa on a 17-day missions trip. And our kids were like all of their young teens and in school, so we took them out and we went. We took the challenge. It cost me a bundle of money. I really did to take five people and all their luggage. We had like 30 pieces of luggage to keep up with. It's ridiculous. Okay? A bunch of luggage, but we went. Amazing opportunity. Our kids even got to minister. We got to minister back in the bush. I preached over a thousand pastors. It was a fantastic time. We really grew a lot, and it changed our kids' lives forever. So if you ever get a chance to go to a mission field, South Korea or anywhere else, go. Because it will affect your life forever. But at the end of the trip, we took the last three days, and we went on a safari to kind of debrief, to kind of like, okay, go over the things that we did. But what a beautiful time. We went on this safari. We got into these trucks. They had no top on them, and they took us out of the, the wild. Amazing time of seeing animals in their natural habitat. Lions, tigers, giraffes, you name it. You know, hippos, alligators, crocodiles, everything was there. It was ridiculous. Monkeys, <laughs> chimpanzees, I mean, they were, you know, they're kind of mean sometimes. But anyway, but just to watch and see these animals as they were in, their, in the wild. They were active, aggressive, free to roam, and free to live. Let me say that again. Free to roam, free to live. We saw life. We saw death. A couple of kills. That's part of it, I guess. But it was just a powerful thing to see. Now, we come home and we go to our zoo. What a disappointment. Right? <laughs> Holy smokes. The zoo experience... Really, to us now, are mundane, boring, as we watch these animals live in cages. It's too safe. It's too tame. It's too predictable. We see 100-pound lions, bored, immaculated, behind protective plexiglass, so people can look at them. They're sort of free, because in our mindset in America, we've made this kind of place where like we're going to try to make this like their natural habitat but yet it has walls around it so they're kind of free but they are limited in their freedom right yeah. Yeah. as i think about this experience in a safari and an experience in a zoo i, I can't help but wonder if the church today if we don't do to people what <laughs> zoos do to animals, uh -oh. wow. stay with me, okay? It's not intentional, it's actually with good intentions, but to help people, we often tame them, make them nice instead of dangerous. How many of you know that Jesus came not just to save you, not to make you nice, but to make you dangerous against evil? Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. Jesus died to make us dangerous, to set us free, to live, and to give life. To live and to give life. I want to focus on that right there. To give life. We're free to give life. I want to read a very familiar scripture for you tonight, but I want to take it a little further. We all know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoso, whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in the order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Now listen to this verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes into the light 
so that it may be clearly seen that His works have been carried out by God. I want you to understand that. Okay? When we come to Jesus, we then in turn start living in the light, start living in the life so that He is glorified. That's what it's all about. In the church today, we seem to look at life from the negative. We seem to look at Christianity from the negative, from caged up views. Listen, I, I visit a lot of churches over this past year, and I've seen this. Yes, life is hard. Full of suffering, Jesus tells us that. But Jesus, with, with Jesus, we are more than conquerors. We live above negativity. We live above death. We live above it. We don't have to entertain the negative thoughts. Be negative people. This is what I want to talk to you about tonight. Jesus came to open the cage and let us roam in the safari. Live life and give life. Live life and give life. That's what it's all about, church. The Word of God is life. It's not death. Hope, not hurt. We need to stop reading God's Word negatively. For instance, what is the first thought that comes to your mind when I read this Scripture? The first thought. First thought. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What's the first thought that comes to your mind? You know, we think of suffering. We think of what we have to give up. We think of Christ's sin, perhaps. And we should. But why did He suffer? He suffered to set us free. So when you're carrying these crosses down the street, here's what you need to understand. Pick up your cross daily means to flash victory in the face of evil regardless of what you are facing. Yeah. You always think, I gotta pick up my cross, oh, all this pain and all this heartache in my life, and I gotta carry this cross today. All these burdens that are coming against me, all this stuff that's coming upon me. That's my cross. No, it's not. Your cross has already overcome that. Flash victory over it. Live in hope because if you entertain that thought, Satan has you beat down. Satan has you put down. And you're defeated again. And then all of a sudden you begin to talk negative. All of a sudden you begin to think negative. All of a sudden you begin to doubt. All of a sudden you begin to fear. All these things start to happen. We, call, we are called to live life, not illustrate death. You are of God, little children, John says, and have overcame them because He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world. Mm. When we live negatively as martyrs, we're giving into the attitude Satan wants God's people to have. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes whew, I wouldn't follow that Jesus either. You say you're a Christian and you walk around and you're like a martyr, you're negative, you're doubtful, you're fearful, you're questioning everything. It's like, why aren't people following me? Oh, well, I wonder why. I don't want that Jesus either. Because my Jesus lifted me above that. My Jesus isn't like that. Who wants to live for God if it's, if it's negative and confining? He didn't come to condemn, neither should we. Now here's what, sir, where some of you may be tonight. You may be condemning yourself. You may be living in condemnation, not with other people, but on yourself. Jesus came. When you gave your life to Jesus, you said, Lord, here I am. He took all of that condemnation off. It's gone. Why do you keep putting it back on? Jesus came to teach us how to give life in a world full of death and destruction. I'm going somewhere with this. That's why Paul writes, do all things without complaining and disputing. 
I hate that scripture. <laughs> Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So stop griping and complaining, right? <laughs> That's tough. So here's what I want you to ask you to ask yourself tonight before I go on. I want you to ask yourself this question. Does my life connect the dots for others so they can meet God? Am I living condemned in a cage or free in a safari? Does my life help connect the dots for people to understand who God is? What God is all about? You are here to give life. You are here to love one another. That's how the world will know you belong to Jesus. That's why we're here. Now I want to take you back to the Old Testament. To a guy by the name of Elijah. We know Elijah, right? Yeah. Elijah. And if you would, if you have your Bibles, you can turn all the way back to 1 Kings. Chapter 17. Amazing story. <laughs> Elijah shows us that we are to live and give life under every situation. Now, I don't know what some of you are going through tonight. Some of you are facing things that I can't even imagine. Some of you have got stuff going on in your mind, your heart, everything. You love Jesus, but this stuff is overwhelming. Elijah shows us we are to live and give under every situation. Jezebel had a hit out for Elijah. Wanted to kill Elijah. 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 I get it here. He's on the run. God leads him to a woman who has a son. He asks her for some food. This is after he fed him with ravens, dirty birds. But he leads him to this woman who has a son. They have very little food left. Elijah says, make me some bread. And the woman says, but, but this is all I have left. In fact, my son and I are going to eat this as our last meal and we're going to die. But Elijah said, no, if you will feed it, if you will cook it and feed me the man of God, then God will take care of you. You know what he's telling her? Pay your tithe. Give to God first. So she obeys him. And then she goes over to his flower, big flower pot, looks into it, and there's all kinds of meal in there. And her and her sons live, her and her son live for a long time. Because she put God first, okay? Big lesson right there. The bit of flour will not run dry. And it didn't. But later, her son dies. He dies anyway. Gets sick and dies. She becomes angry and calls for Elijah. Elijah comes and, and, and she says, Man of God, what have you done to me? Look, my son is dead. What are you going to do about it? The Bible says he was sick. His sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. How many of you know that you can get that way even when you're still breathing? You can get so beat down, so tired, so exhausted, so much pressure that you just don't feel that there's any life left at all in you, right? But this guy was really dead. All hope was gone. Death had taken over. Her first experience of flower provision didn't matter now. Let me pause there for a moment. See, often we come and give our lives to Jesus. He does wonderful works in our hearts. We feel fantastic. Our salvation, we have this experience with God. But, yet, but then we go out and we get swallowed up by negativity. By death. There's no breath. We become maybe angry. 
But Elijah had the answer. He says, give me the boy. He gives him her son. He takes him up to his bed, into his room, lays him on the bed. Then he gets down on top of him, face to face, hands to hands, chest to chest, and begins to pray. The Bible says he did this three times. He wasn't going to give up. He continued to pray. Continued to pray. The Bible says that God heard his voice. And God revived the young man. Okay? He takes the young man back and he gives it to gives him to his mother. The mother rejoices. Now here's the point I want you to get right now. Verse 24 of 1 Kings chapter 17 says this. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. I, I want you to get something here. Okay? She had seen Elijah provide food miraculously, but it took the miracle of life that caused her to believe. It's the same today, church. It's the same today. It's when we give life and show people life, show people hope, show people who Jesus is, not tell them, but show them who He is. We bring life into their lives. They know then that we are people of truth. You understand what I'm saying to you tonight? This is something that's troubling me in my heart because I see people come to church Sunday after Sunday, week after week. They walk out the doors and they blend in and live like the world the rest of the week. There's no life in them. There's no hope given. They're just surviving. Look, we're not called to survive. We're called to thrive. We're called to move out. We're called to live for Jesus. We're called to love one another. The Scripture says, they will know you belong to me by the way that you love one another. By the way that you give life. By the way that you give hope. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill. That's life. That's life. But when we walk around with negativity, when we walk around with no hope, when we walk around overwhelmed by our circumstances, and people see that, and we call ourselves Christians, we're not giving life. That bugs me. Because you either believe or you don't believe. You either trust God or you don't trust God. You either are all in or you're not. When you sign up and you give your life to Jesus and you start following what He wants you to do, your problems become His problems. And He takes care of His problems. Are you with me? Jesus said, the thief, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What does he mean by that? You know, sometimes we think, well, he's come to make us rich. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't think so. You can make as much money as you want. Be as poor as you want. To me, what that scripture means is this. To me, that scripture means that regardless of your situation through Christ, you can have life and have it so abundant that it flows out of you onto other people. And let me tell you something. The darker the background, the brighter the light. The darker the background, the brighter the light. No darkness can put out one single light. Darkness can't do that. So no matter what you're going through today, no matter how much you're, over, you're, you're overwhelmed by your circumstances, you, you're more than a conqueror. You can give life. 
You can walk in hope. You can be that overflowing fountain that just spews out on people life and love. Yes. Right? You with me? Yes. Elijah, who's being persecuted anyway and has a hit out on his life, teaches us in the story the power of life that we can have in Christ. Regardless of what you are facing, let me leave you with a line of attack against negativity. Can I do that? Amen. Or are you guys just always so happy around here that you don't really need that? <laughs> are you guys always positive and always happy or always cheerful? Or is it just when you sing songs? Right? What you experience in here tonight with worship can go with you every day. That's the freedom we have with Jesus Christ. That's the freedom we have. It's not confined to these four walls. In fact, I personally believe that the greatest revival that we can have is outside these doors. So let me give you a few thoughts here today on this story that will help you overcome negativity and death. And I want you to write them down. I want you to remember them because you know what? As soon as you walk out this door, Satan's going to hit you with negative stuff. It might be what somebody says. It might be what you're thinking. It might be what you got to face tomorrow. But here's what I want you to hear. Take home with you. Number one, don't panic. Don't panic. Elijah's response when the frustrated, hurting woman came to him was, Give me your son. Give me your son. He didn't make excuses. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe I should just move on down the road here. You know, we got a bunch of believers in America today that are, and we just panic. We panic. We start making dumb decisions. We start making decisions that are outside the will of God. So let me ask you this, because God's been dealing with me on this. When you hear negativity, when you hear negative news, when you are hit in the face with Satan's attacks, what are your first thoughts? What's the first thing that comes into your mind? Oh, here I go again. I knew God was going to drop the hammer. I knew it was over for me. I knew this Christian thing was just a, a fling. I knew church on the street was just a big bunch of crazy people. You know, here we go again. You know, what's the first thoughts? What's the first thoughts? A I, I, I thing that God has really convicted me about. Because I'm going to tell you what mine are. I'll be honest with you. Fear. Oh my goodness. Criticism. Oh, complaining. Blaming. If they hadn't have done that, this wouldn't happen. Get intimidated. No, come on, let's get real. We know Satan is, is out there. We know Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy, right? We know Satan is out to get you. He is. But somehow along the way, when we're faced with an overwhelming opposition and with trouble and with something negative, all of a sudden, we lose our power. We start believing in Satan and his tricks. When Jesus on the cross defeated him a long time ago. You're his child. You're his child. We need to understand that. So what's your first thoughts? The weapons of our warfare, Paul writes, are not carnal. You, know, you don't go out and beat somebody up. But mighty in God. Listen to this. For pulling down strongholds. Casting down imaginations. Anything, any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Cast 
casting down every imagination. You know what those chains are? It's what you're thinking. You've lost your thoughts. You've lost it. You need to capture that thought and say, no. See the source. I see the source of death. And that comes from where? Satan. And rise up. Stop receiving negative reports from people. Stop receiving put downs. Stop receiving all the hard stuff that people throw at you. You are a child of God. Jesus died for you. He set you free. But it's our thoughts that get us into trouble. We pick the chains back up and we start putting them back on again. Oh, we get all excited about breaking chains, but why are we putting them back on? You take them off in your heart, in your mind. And you point to Jesus, the author, the finisher of your faith. So maybe tonight we need to ask God to change the way we see problems. Elijah saw this problem as an opportunity for God to work. Elijah saw this problem, this woman's hurt, her pain. Who knows what she was saying to him? It was her son. I mean, she, the scripture says, what do I have to do with you, man of God? I think there's probably a lot of other stuff that she said to him. Okay? The Bible doesn't record that. But he didn't receive that. He thought through it and says, I understand where she's coming from. This is my opportunity to bring glory to God. Amen. Number two, don't panic. Number two, don't run. Don't run. Elijah didn't ignore it. He didn't turn a deaf ear to the woman. He didn't start blaming her and start saying, well, don't come at me with that stuff. He didn't argue with her. You know what he did? He took on trouble. He said, bring it on. Because greater, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Bring it on. I have already won the victory. He brought him into his own room. Stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord. Now, he didn't give up after the first time. I mean, first of all, this is a dead person. How many of us are going to stretch ourselves out on a dead person? Now I'm talking. He's talking about real death here. I'm not. I'm talking about people that you see every day that are just walking dead. Spiritually, they're dead. Take it on. But he stretched himself out on them, not once. See, sometimes we pray one time. Well, God didn't answer. It must not be His will. Not twice. Three times. He sought the Lord. He prayed to God. He asked God to help him. I heard a message this morning in a church. Powerful, wonderful message. One of the largest churches in town. I just kind of popped in. and The special speaker, it was a fantastic message about our nation. About our nation being in trouble and in a decline. And if it's ever going to change, he says the church has to rise up. Because the church is declining just as society is declining. Okay? And he explained it in such a way that it was powerful. Really, really was good. And non-condemning. Very good. I can't explain it the way he did. But it was powerful. But I guess I got me thinking. And he's right. We have to rise up in power. You remember, according to Mark, when Jesus commissioned the disciples, he sent them out. But here's what he said in Mark. These signs shall follow those who believe. These signs, this, these are the signs. In my name, they will cast out demons. I face demons every day, don't you? They will speak with new tongues. Your positive words coming out, the language that you do use, hope. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, 
It's not going to by any means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I have a message in that. Each one of those are symbolic. Okay? But the bottom line is, because of Jesus, you don't have to be afraid of anybody, anything, any word, anywhere. The power isn't just limited to the pastors. You know? The power isn't just li limited to a person that just reads and prays all the time, 24 hours a day. They're powerful. The power isn't just limited to that, that guy at church that's just always exciting. It's everybody. When Jesus is in you, when Jesus is in you, the Bible says the same Spirit that raised Him from the dead dwells in you. That's amazing. Holy smokes. I can raise dead things. I can speak life. I can command people to straighten up and live right by the way I'm living. Not condemning, but by the way I'm living. When I walk into a room, I can change things. You can too. Because Jesus is in you. So stop running from problems. And allow Christ to use you to win against all odds. You may not know how. And this is the secret where Elijah, he goes in three times and prays. You may not have the wisdom and the creativity and the strategy and the knowledge that you might need to get through the problems you're facing right now, but God does. So you have to seek Him. You have to continue to seek Him. You have to continue to read His Word. That's part of seeking. You have to pray. You have to write. You have to study. And pretty soon, Scripture says, I love it, that God heard His voice in other words, God says, here's the strategy. See, God's got an answer to your problem. But you've got to draw near to Him to find the answer to your problem. Problems don't come to push us away from God. They come to push us to God. The strategies will be revealed as you seek God. Well, not there yet. Well, keep seeking. He's not done with you yet. And as soon as He, he wants this complete deliverance and your faith is strong enough, the answer will be there. And you're going to go, wow, that was so simple. So don't run. Stop running. Number three, dive in. Dive in. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. I love that. It wasn't like he didn't hear him the first time. What the scripture is basically saying right there is that then God gave him the answer. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. I don't know who you hang around. I don't know what your family's like. I don't know what your situation is like. I don't know that person might be the most boring, dead, evil, wicked person on the face of the earth. But as you continue to pray, you continue to seek God, God works miracles. And as long as that person is breathing, God can perform a miracle. Please receive that. Don't give up on anybody. You keep praying. But more importantly, you keep living for Jesus. Like Elijah, whatever situation you find yourself in today, if we seek God, our voice will be heard. And lives, life will return. I had a conversation today on my way home with my wife and my mother-in-law. We were talking about the service and talking about the situation. And my mother lost me, well, because she's talking about the young generation. I defend the young generation. Okay? 
Why are they not committed? Why are they not going to church? Why are they not? Be, why? What's going on with them? And I looked at her and I said, Why should they? Why should they? When my generation, maybe we haven't done a good enough job living our faith in front of them. Because as a pastor for 37 years, I have seen people come to church. They worship God. They speak Christianese. They all, they know the language. They know the verbiage. They do. They, then they go home and they treat their family like junk. They go to work and they're terrible workers. They're horrible bosses. They play sports and they're horrible winners and losers. You know what I'm saying? So I, my response is, is that is, is that we need to show them truly who Jesus is. We need to connect the dots. Okay? Because they're confused. I would be too. I saw it when I was growing up. Confused. In fact, I've seen parents and families get involved in church so much so that they don't have to deal with their problems at home. See, at church, I can go and cover up everything. At church, I don't, I, you know, I can go and, and leave my relationship with my wife back at home. At church, I can go leave my rebellious kids at home. At church, I can go and be a good person, and it's a different place, but as soon as I come home, I'm hit with this stuff. you got to dive in. Because that's where it starts, right? Yes. That's where giving life starts. It's a double standard. It's compromise. And that's why people don't want. That's why we're not seeing a revival like we want to see. We're, we're, we're just kind of blending in. Again, the greatest revival in America should start not in church. It should start in our homes. It should start in our workplaces. It should start when our, on our ball fields. It should start out on the streets. It should start in our everyday going around living life. That's where it starts. Church, that's when you come back with everybody that's doing that and have an amazing time of praise and worship and power. Wow! The church is just a filling station. The church is just a filling station. It's where you come and get, get filled up, tanked up, and then go back out. That's all that is. And this is a little different here at Church on the Street. Some of you get to live here. That's pretty cool. So now you got to face it when you go back to your rooms tonight. <laughs> that roommate, that roommate that you've been struggling with, you need to speak some life into that relationship. You'll never see eye to eye on everything, but Jesus can bring you together. And I want to tell you something. God's not going to reveal the answers to you getting that over that overwhelming mountain that you are facing until you deal with the problem right in front of you. And it may be that ugly looking roommate that you are with right now. None of you are ugly. I'm sorry. You get my point, right? You get my thoughts. See, we want God to transport us. We're not that spiritual yet. We're here. There's all kinds of problems here. Over here is our promise. Then we want to say, God, it's cool. We will be Philip, right? When God says, no, I want you to work through it. Amen. Right? Come on, Israel. You've got to work through it. You've got to take the promised land. People often get busy so they don't have to deal with issues. I'm here to tell you tonight, deal with the issues 
and God will move you forward spiritually. Speak life, live life, give love. Stop running. Stop panicking. Stop running. Dive in. Because what, what problem you're facing right in front of you every day is an opportunity for God to be glorified. So stop complaining about the problem and let God be glorified through you working through it and giving life. Right? So let me ask you, what are you afraid of? I really want you to think about this. Think about your life. Think about what you've come through. Think about what you're facing. Think about what you have to do tomorrow. Think about all the negativity that you're in. What are you facing? What are you afraid of? Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. You are more than a conqueror. My goodness. You know what that means? You don't just win. You, you absolutely destroy. You are absolutely lifted up in the name of Jesus. You soar. Another question. What are you or who are you running from? What are you or who are you running from? Come on. Our image. Good thought. Very likely. Very likely. That's a good thought. Our image, she says. Stop running. Stop running. When Jesus is in you, you know what the Bible says? <coughs> Ephesians 2.10. Anybody know that? You're God's workmanship. <laughs> created in Christ Jesus to do good work. Here's a masterpiece. When you look at yourself in the mirror, say, I'm God's masterpiece. <laughs> Some of us are still being worked on, but we're still in master control. My point is, is your situation is an opportunity for God to be glorified and for you to live and to give life. Every day. So you, you choose. Live and give life or stay in a cage of fear and intimidation. You can live in the zoo, you can live in the safari. I want to live in the safari. Man, no limits. We have a God that takes away the limits. Takes the lid off. Isn't that amazing? So would you pray with me tonight? Father, as we conclude, Lord, I want to pray for those that are here tonight that Lord, are just really living in fear, intimidation, they really haven't received who they are in you. And Father, they are a different person. They're filled with hope. They're filled with joy. They're filled with life. The fruit of the Spirit is available to them all the time. And Father, I want to pray that you would help us to change our thinking. Change our thinking. I'd like to just ask a question with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. Who are you here tonight? You're just, you're on the run. You're afraid of something. Fear is controlling your life. Stand up. Because the first act of winning against any issue is admitting it. Thank you. Fear. Fear. I don't know what you're afraid of, but it's fear. Intimidation. You're, you're just kind of like holding back. And Satan's using it to keep you from getting life. And Father, you see every person that's standing here tonight. You know their heart. You know their spirit. You know exactly what they are afraid of. They panic. They run. 
and they fail to be the witness they desire to be in their heart because fear comes into their life. You did not give us a spirit of fear, Lord. You gave us a spirit, Lord, of love, discipline. Father, you've given us a spirit, Lord, not of timidity, God, but of strength and power. Father, I ask you right now to help us to put on power. Father, in Jesus' name, I bind the fear, the intimidation, the words. And I pray that you would help us, God, in our first thoughts. That, Lord, our first thoughts are about power, strength, freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because other people are watching us, just like Elisha. And as soon as we give them life, show them life, they will believe. They'll follow you. They'll believe the truth. Father, we are life givers. And I pray that you would just take every finger out of our hearts and minds as a hindrance in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you, Lord. Bless them. Give them an amazing week this week. No weapon forged against you shall prosper. Let me give you a thought on that. Weapons are going to be forged against you. But they won't prosper. They won't, they won't prosper. And so we have to understand that. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you again for you guys being here. It's awesome. Amen. Let's go out here victorious and share the love of Christ wherever we go. Amen.